Hi again, everybody, and welcome back. We're continuing our, continuing our chapter on, um, on chapter nine on potential energy and conservation of energy. And uh, I'm starting on this slide right here. It's actually a few slides back from where um, I want to start this video segment. But I want to remind you that this chapter kind of has two parts. We're dealing with conservation of energy, or, or I should say conservative forces, where all energy and all parts of the system are equal, and then non-conservative forces. A you know, conservative force is like gravity or like springs, and a non-conservative force is something like friction or some other external force acting on our system. So I want to start on this slide right here just to remind us that at any point, if we're dealing with conservative forces, at any point, the, uh, at the total system energy, potential and kinetic, the total system energy at any one point, say initial, is equal to the total system energy final. We assume that, or that's, that is true, if all energy is conserved. However, now we're going to contrast against that. Now we're going to deal with, and this is the slide we're actually going to start on right So I'm jumping forward like three or four slides. Work done by non-conservative forces, like friction, or like some other things like, um, uh, like an engine. Uh, an engine or a motor in a car is a non-conservative force. It's not a part of the, the car's rolling energy. It's, a, it's, you might say, it's an external force causing the car to move, even though it may be on uh, flat ground or maybe going uphill. Um, so we're denoting this with a W for work, obviously, and then NC is non-conservative. And what's important to note is that, again, since we usually kind of think of friction as being the main non-conservative force, and it, and it is, and friction is like a negative force. It takes energy out of the system. It's just as true that you can have positive non-conservative forces. Like I said before, like, like that comes from an engine or something like that. Energy comes from somewhere else. Um, so this non-conservative work can be positive or it can be negative. All right, so I'm just going to put a positive slash negative right there. So what that means is, and therefore, there's going to be some sort of change in energy in the system. Energy, total system energy initial, is not going to e equal the um, total energy final. But there's going to be some change that takes place. And as long as we account for that change, then we can solve for all the other um, states of energy at the, the various different points in the, in the system, initial and final. All right? But this non-conservative work either puts energy into the system, so it's a positive change in energy, or it could be a negative change in energy, like you might have with friction, where friction robs the system of energy and you don't get it back. Okay? Well, like I said before, friction, a very common, I should say, non-conservative workforce. The work done by friction, and we've done this before, is it's the friction, it's a kinetic friction force times the distance, right? I should actually say minus, right? Because work is always force times distance times the cosine of that angle phi, right? Well, since friction always acts 180 degrees opposite of your direction of motion, that phi is going to be 180, and that's why we have that minus sign, because cosine of 180 is negative 1. All right, but the work done by friction is the kinetic friction force times the distance that it's applied over. And so if we spread out this uh, kinetic friction force right here, we have our negative mu k times mg. That's our force, and that's our distance. And so that's our description for the work that friction does. I mean, friction always does negative work. So it results in our final system energy being less than the initial system energy. Energy is not conserved, but it is in fact lost. And like I said before, as long as we account for that, then uh, we can figure everything else out. So now our equation becomes energy initial, doesn't equal energy final, but energy initial plus some change in energy equals energy final. All right, so it could be positive non-conservative work, like an engine or a motor putting energy into the system, or it could be negative non-conservative work, like friction, taking energy out of the system. That's what this change in energy is right here, and this is the only thing that really changes from uh, a few slides ago where we said energy initial equals energy final. It doesn't equal that, but as long as we account for this loss of energy, and that really is our non-conservative work right there, then we'll be able to figure out what the energy initial or energy final is or the energy to any other point of the system. So there's just one little difference right here. We're adding this non-conservative work. By the way, I always put a plus sign 
out front. And then if the non-conservative work is negative, I put minus in parentheses. Or if it's plus, well, I don't need to put plus in front of it, but that goes in parentheses too. But I always put a, min a, a plus sign out front so I don't like double up my negatives. Does that make sense? So put a plus sign up front and plus negative it means you wind up subtracting, right? Okay. So we're going to apply this to example 9, 9, and that's this video segment right here. But I will say the next couple of examples, there's a golfer example, there's a sliding block example and a spring, all deal with um, conservation of energy. Uh, oops. Sorry, where are we right here? Uh, here we are. Conservation of energy dealing with non-conservative forces, non-conservative work. All right. So by the way, just real quick as... As an example, let's say you start your, your whole system, potential and kinetic energy, has five joules of energy. Okay, and um, your system ends up with, I don't, I don't know, three joules of energy. Well, why does it have less energy than it, than it started out with? Because something took two joules of energy out of it. I mean, it's basic addition right there, but we need to account for that. As long as we account for that non-conservative work, whether it's positive or negative. So if something put two joules of energy into the system, like say an engine or a motor, then our final system energy would be greater than the initial system energy. Okay? So that's what we're, that's what we're dealing, dealing with right here. All right? Let's do example 9.9. Nine. And I'm not going to have a whole lot of space right here, so I am going to have to wind up shrinking this down a little bit. Um, but we have an Atwood machine. All right? And this Atwood machine has two masses, one hanging and one sliding. All right, the hanging mass wants to um, drop down right here, right? Um, but the sliding mass wants to move sideways, but there is friction. We've got kinetic friction right there. And so we need to find the final speed, the V final of that system when that, when that hanging mass lands right there. Okay, does that make sense? So, let's call this and this our initial position, and this right here, and this right here, our final position. And I should probably do this in different colors, too. I'll do initial in green, all right, and final in blue right there. So, energy, initial. So right here, at this point, and at this point right here, where's all the energy of the system? Well, the energy of the system is uh, it's not moving, right? It's released from rest. So we can say kinetic energy initial or initial, yeah, equals zero. But what kind of energy does it have? Well, right here, it's about ready to drop. It's got potential energy, right? Potential energy due to gravity. And that's going to be what our energy initial of the system is right there. UGI, potential energy due to gravity. Okay? Well, what kind of energy does it have finally at the bottom right here? Here's a final position there and there. All right. Well, it has kinetic energy, right? It's moving right when it hits the bottom right there. Our energy final equals kinetic final um, because this thing's moving, but also this is moving right here. I don't have to come into play. We'll have to account for those two masses in just a, in just a little bit. All right? But what is working against the system? If this were a frictionless surface, the whole system would move uh, effortlessly and it wouldn't, um, there wouldn't be any issue. But, why, but what is the non-conservative work in the system done by? It's done by kinetic friction. All right? That, non-conservative work right there. I should really just draw it as non-conservative. And it happens to be negative, right? Negative non-conservative work done by friction. So that's going to take energy out of the system. All right? So our non-conservative work equals, do you remember our, um, our equation for, for uh, work done by friction? Negative mu k <clears throat> times m. In this case, the m is mass 1, right? Mass 1 times gravity times the distance d that it moves. It moves from here to there. The same distance that mass 2 falls from here to here. All right, so that distance is the same. 
So we want to find the speed of the blocks just before mass 2 lands. So the speed of the blocks is going to be in here. It's going to be in our final kinetic energy because we know kinetic energy of the system is 1 half mv squared, right? 1 half m v final squared right there. We're going to be solving for that v final. But let me shrink this down a little bit so we have a little bit more space and then um, we can set up our, um, our, 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 our energy equation, okay? So I'm just going to write this in black from here on out because um, I've got too many colors going on. So what we're going to say is our energy initial plus energy, messed it up already, plus our non-conservative work, in this case done by friction, equals our energy final. All right, what's our initial energy? Well, we said right here it's potential energy due to gravity, right? But it's potential energy only of this mass. Does this have potential energy? It does, but it doesn't change its height at all. It is some distance off the floor, but it doesn't change its height, so there's no change in potential energy. So it's really just this guy right here. All right? So that's going to be m2g times our distance d. Does that tell us what? Yep, our distance d right there. Okay? Plus our non-conservative work done by what? Done by friction, right? Fix that plus sign right there. All right, that's going to be mu k times mass 1 times gravity times distance d. Mu k, I should put a minus sign in front of that, right? Mass 1 times g times our distance d equals our final kinetic energy. Now, that's, this is interesting. Mass 2 is dropping downwards, but by the time it gets done dropping, mass, two is, mass, I'm sorry, mass 1 is moving as well. So really the whole system, this object and this object, both have kinetic energy. So it's going to be our kinetic energy of the system right here. So that's going to be one half mass of the system times final velocity of the system squared. And that's what we're solving for. All right. So if we can solve for this final velocity of the system, we can plug everything else in and, um, and we should be good to go. All right. Well, let's, um, let's do just that. What I'm going to do is take this 2 right here, multiply it up. Okay. So I'll, let me see here. Okay, so that goes away. So 2 is going to go here and 2 is going to go here. And the mass of the system is going to get divided down, right? M cis, M cis. And finally, we're going to square root the whole thing because this is a square right here. So our final velocity, our equation for our final velocity, final velocity of the system is going to be the square root of 2. I might be able to combine this a little bit. In fact, I'll put the 2 over mass of the system times mass 2 times g times the distance d plus negative mu k times mass 1 times g times d. You could probably factor out a few things as well. Um, you could probably factor out the g and the d. In fact, let's just do that right now. I think I can fit that in. g times d, so that these guys go away right here, right? They get factored out. So that way, inside of parentheses, we have a little bit less going on. So that's going to be equal to the square root of 2 times 9.81. That's our g, sorry about that, 9, times our distance d. What is that distance d that the whole system moves? 0.5 meters, right? 0.500 meters divided by the mass of the system, all right? What is the mass of the system? M cis, that equals 2.4 plus 1.80, oh, right? So that's 3.4, that's uh, 4.2 um, kilograms. 4.2, oh, kilograms. That is our mass of the system uh, that we have right here in this denominator. All right, then inside the brackets, all we have is 
uh, mass 2, which is 1.80, plus, ooh, I hope I have enough room here. You know, of course I do. I'm going to shrink that down a little bit more. There we go. Um, plus our uh, negative mu k. So negative, our mu k is 0 0.450 times mass 1. Because remember, we factored out the g and the d right here, so they came out front. So mass 1 is 2.40. Oh, I might have had enough space. All right, end bracket. All right, so it's 1.80 plus the product of these two guys right here inside the bracket. Times all this in the numerator divided by 4.20 in the denominator. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and uh, do that myself. You do too. Let's see what we get. All right, and after a bunch of number punching, I have our final velocity of the system is going to be 1 point, I'm going to round that up to 1.30 meters per second. And we solve for that final velocity because we know that our final velocity is a function of the final kinetic energy, and we got the final kinetic energy by writing out an equation for the whole system. Initial total system energy plus whatever non-conservative work is done, by friction equals the final system energy. All right, this is all of the system. E initial system, E final system. So system, that means potential and kinetic, potential and kinetic. But this is the only difference between this and, um, and uh, conservative work, and that is you've got either some non-conservative work adding to the energy to the system or ta um, taking energy out of the system. All right. So that was a little bit uh, longer than usual. Thanks for hanging in there and following along. Please let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you on the next one.